Well, it's finally here, what you've been waiting for, the art history session. <laughs> All right? Somebody said they haven't, no one's talked about any pictures, but they weren't here for what I said first, and, and certainly Arthur talked about some pictures. Wonderful talk last night. Thank you, Arthur. So uh, the teleprompter says that this session is riveting. <laughs> and I'm counting on one Jennifer and two Emilys to uh, keep my poll numbers up. I think this is probably the largest number of people assembled in the conference yet. <laughs> I, I hope the Park Service is here to photograph you all. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I think it's true. Tremendously true. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to go to London and Paris uh, here, and uh, I, I just want you to know that the artist these people are talking about was not the first guy. Uh, the first guy was, uh, was much more flamboyant uh, and much more self-important than Buffalo Bill ever thought he was. His name was George Catlin. And he went to London and, uh, because he couldn't sell his collection in Washington, D.C. And he spent several years there. And just to, to give Buffalo Bill something to l go by as a model, he started his little tableau vivant. Uh, entertainments with Indian actors and dancers uh, around his gallery of, of Indian paintings in London. And then uh, when he found he wasn't going to sell it, his collection in London, he went to Paris and he did the same thing in Paris. And there's a painting up in the Whitney Gallery, which is really wonderful. It shows George Catlin with Louis Philippe and his queen in the Tuileries, I think, and a group of uh, Omaha or uh, Ojibwa Indians dancing in the foreground and Catlin's leaning over telling the queen what's going on. So it's pretty cool. And, and so Buffalo Bill had a model to follow and we'll see, uh, see if, if he can live up to Catlin's uh, initial enterprise. Now, uh, there's another artist that's going to be mentioned, who's going to be mentioned today, Beer Albert Bierstadt. And I want you to know when two things are very important. When Buffalo Bill sailed on the, on the, uh, on the Persian monarch uh, in the spring of uh, 89 for Paris, uh, Burke was there. John Burke was there on the dock to wave goodbye along with Albert Bierstadt. And Burke uh, was yelling out that this is the best looking crew of Indians we've ever taken to Europe. That group we took in 87, they were pretty motley looking compared to these guys. So I'm going to leave it up to these ladies to, to prove uh, that that was or wasn't true, okay? You're doing 87, right? You two are doing 89. Uh, so uh, you're outnumbered at least. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I would like to introduce the first, honored to introduce the first speaker, Emily Burns, uh, who uh, is uh, a, a, pr a professor of uh, art history at Auburn University where she researches the Franco-American cultural exchange in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. Her book, Tran <laughs> Transnational Frontiers, uh, the American West in France, is about to be published by the University of Oklahoma Press. And she's also an essayist in uh, uh, the book and catalog for our forthcoming exhibition next summer here uh, called Albert Bierstadt, Witness to a Changing West, which is also going to be published in June of 2018. And she uh, wrote an essay about Bierstadt in Paris for that uh, catalog. Her talk today is Parisian Frontiers, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and French Masculinities, 1889 to 1906. So we welcome Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. It's always a pleasure to be at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and I want to extend my thanks for continued and long-standing support from many people in this institution, including Peter Hasrick, Karen McWhorter, Mary Robinson, Jeremy Johnston, Linda Clark, 
Mac Frost, and many others. And I also want to thank Frank Christensen uh, for his work with me on my essay for his forthcoming edited volume um, from which this talk today draws. In 1889, oh sorry, I missed my first sentence. Let's start over. Buffalo Bill's Wild West traveled to France twice. In 1889, the show performed in front of its Rocky Mountain backdrop for seven months at Neuilly, outside of Paris, to take advantage of the crowds who had come for the Exposition Universelle. American Indian performers, largely from the Lakota Nation, were escorted on various tours of the city, including two trips to ascend the Eiffel Tower in August, and I suspect that the photograph you see on the right was taken on the occasion of one of those uh, visits. The troupe then traveled to Marseille, in 1905 to 1906, Cody, then well known to the French as Guillaume Bill, returned to France to perform in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower and then to tour 115 destinations across the country. A route map, which you see on your left, published as a souvenir with dates, charted the show's course across the nation. And in many different archives in France, you can find where people wrote to um, the publicity office asking for more information about Buffalo Bill's Wild West that they would forward this map uh, around um, to the curious. In addition to presenting a mythologized history of US settler colonialism, Buffalo Bill's Wild West participated in wider cultural discourses in France at the turn of the century. In particular, its circulation tapped into fears about the feminization of French culture. For many, the cowboy signaled the epitome of rugged masculinity, rough, uncouth, virile, dynamic, fiercely independent, and living on the edge of an uncharted frontier. Though some observers hesitated that the cowboy seemed too uncivilized to be emulated. This talk analyzes the role of visual culture of the circulating Buffalo Bill's Wild West in shaping competitive conversations about gender and national character within Franco-American exchange. In 1870-1871, France was decimated in the Franco-Prussian War, a defeat widely attributed to limitations in French industry, particularly from outdated railway lines. Critics on both sides of the Atlantic increasingly announced French cultural and political decline. One US journal printed in 1891 that while the birth rate was down across Europe, and I quote, the rate of decrease is increasing more rapidly in France than in any other country. And soon the death rate will exceed the birth rate. Gendered discussions of French character as effeminate and decadent arose from fears of cultural decline. Some critics mocked esthetes, such as the poet Robert de Montesquieu, as indicative of a crisis of masculinity. Giovanni Boldini's portrait depicts the aristocrat on the left with a pristine silk suit and white gloves seated on a white chair, his long walking stick across his body, head turned to the side in a dramatic gesture. Georges Gersat's caricature underscores Montesquieu's feminized decadence by mocking his mannerisms as indicative of a frenetic and flighty persona. Surely this wasn't the future of the French nation. Beginning in 1894, the Dreyfus Affair, in which French Captain Albert Alfred Dreyfus was falsely accused of treason, incited an extended discussion of a perceived loss of French virility. As the historian Christopher Forth has shown, the act of treason was gendered as weak and effeminate. In this context, the iconic enterprise centerpiece of the Exposition Universelle of 1889, Gustave Eiffel's Tower, might be understood as a visual argument for French prowess with its phallic industrial form projecting into the air. Now this metaphor is apparent in these two cartoons that I show you, including one on the left that cohered the body of the tower with the body of Eiffel, his centrally placed cane serving as a third leg. The image on the right is labeled, from the grandeur of the work is measured the grandeur of the man. And it depicts the big headed figure of Eiffel, stroking the shaft of his tower while leaning on a miniature pyramid to show the difference in scale. Um, a carefully placed miniature Notre Dame, which you can see here, 
implies that Eiffel has harnessed the power of French Gothic architecture in his contemporary projects. The curvilinear elements of the tower, which some registered as feminine in the burgeoning movement of Art Nouveau, only lightly moderated the masculine emphasis drawn out by these images. The gender performances of Cody and Buffalo Bill's Wild West in France capitalized on these anxieties. The cover of the caricature magazine Puck depicts an allegorical figure of La France wearing striped dress and Breton sable. Here, her arm is, like Eiffel's in the previous caricature, wrapped possessively around the tower. She raises up a figure of Cody, his name labeled on the cowboy hat, as if to inspect him more closely. Her smile suggests her pleasure at what is labeled a recent favorite. France's gendered embrace of Cody's masculinity is juxtaposed with an outlier in the background at the right. Shaking his fist at Cody and the allegory of France. This figure represents a previous favorite, General George Ernest Boulanger, who attempted to ride the populist support for his election early in 1889 into a coup d'etat to create a government to avenge the defeat of the Franco-Prussian War. He failed in his attempts to take the government, fled in April of 1889, just about a month before Buffalo Bill's Wild West arrived. Two years later, he committed suicide. This cartoon depicts Boulanger exiled from Paris and the Exposition, his sword limp between his legs. Parallels between Cody and Boulanger extended to their use of mass media. In order to gain support for his candidacy, Boulanger's supporters covered major monuments in the city with electoral materials. And here I show you the cover of L'Illustration, um, depicting the Paris lion sculptures in the Luxembourg Gardens, plastered with posters, not just on the pedestal, but on the body of the sculpture itself. Buffalo Bill's Wild West advertising materials had a similar visual presence in the city and in Exposition Universelle publications, which some Parisians contended were a foreign invasion. Militaristic propaganda transformed into the showmanship of a so-called military hero who incited his own cultural coup of Paris. A caricature in L'Illustration from 1889 depicts two men contemplating a Buffalo Bill's Wild, poster, Wild West poster, and you can see it's labeled at the top, Buffalo Bill, great exhib. The figure of Cody is seen within the poster charging out of the frame wielding a gun, and his placement makes him appear almost to strike the figure in top hat at the left, um, who represents Boulanger. The caption imagines Boulanger demanding that his designer, and I quote in translation from this text, give my electoral posters the artistic character of these here, representing me in the process of toppling the government. So this cartoon presents Cody as achieving where Boulanger had failed with his use of material culture. A reassignment of cultural power was signaled in a full page illustration from the Courrier Francais on August 25th of 1889. The caption reads, from the height of the Eiffel Tower, the three news leaders of the year, the Shah of Persia, Buffalo, and the running of the bulls, accusing Boulanger of monopolizing all the publicity lately and condemning him to pass into the background. In the image, Boulanger's arms are tied to a post behind his back as he floats up on a cloud. Um, and it's kind of hard to see that uh, it's a kind of exaggerated representation of the Eiffel Tower, and the, the three figures are imagined to be seating on the, the pedestal. The figures include um, Nazir al-Din Shah of Persia, who visited the Paris Exposition, a bull to signal Spanish torridor bullfights in Paris, and it writes Cody, wielding puppets of an American Indian and a cowboy. All three of these figures rebuke Boulanger and, and force him to take a backstage to their own uh, publicity stunts. Cody's placement on the tower platform as one of the objects of Boulanger's gaze suggests a transfer of power as the American cowboy sweeps the Frenchman. Yet the humor in these images suggests the instability and tenuous nature of these comparisons. Another French character depicts Buffalo Bill wearing a sombrero and costume associated with the Mexican vaqueros, riding a crown centaur who thumbs her nose at General Boulanger at the right of the scene. This creature may have been a reference to the motif adopted quite early in Cody's career um, as what Louis Warren has called an ideal symbol of frontier life. 
But here with her crown and fleur-de-lis, she acts as an allegory of the French nation that Cody has commandeered. He rides in a large circus ring labeled La Buffalo Bills, while Boulanger sits astride an underfed nag with its head lowered in front of a sign that reads La Boulange Bills, failed show. While Cody's centaur is propped up almost as a phallic extension of Cody's body, Boulanger's nag's head reads as an impotent phallus. These cues emphasize Cody's virility at the expense of the French general's prowess. But the title of the cartoon, which is translated to one ham actor chasing another, uh, it suggests that both of these figures are humorous spectacles rather than serious political players. These images highlight the transnational framing of French political power struggles through Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Through the fallout of Boulanger's failed coup, Cody's displays of masculinity became ambivalent cultural fodder for French audiences. A heroicized image of a self-assured Cody, painted in 1889 by French painter Rosa Bonheur, and on view here in the gallery, so please go and visit this painting. Uh, this image, more than perhaps any other from France in this period, reinforced Cody's masculine ethos by highlighting the former scout's control over his horse, casually trotting along a dirt path, riding his favorite white horse, Tucker. Bonner's painting, which was used to make posters for Buffalo Bill's Wild West, naturalizes a characterization of this confident cowboy. Bonner's painting appeared in other posters that implied a hierarchy between the masculine persona of the American cowboy and the enervated French horseman of the past. And we've seen this poster twice already, but I bring it back again because I think we can unpack it even further in thinking about how these gender discourses are playing through visual culture. So here we have an image of Bonheur sitting at the center, her portrait of Cody on her easel, placed between Napoleon Bonaparte um, and Cody, the latter having, uh, sorry, Napoleon having res experienced resurgence in public attention in the wake of Boulanger's attempted coup. Cody is more active and in control. Napoleon's shoulders instead are slumped and his belly is protruding. This slouching posture seems to offer a subtly ironic comment on the label describing him as the hero of 1796. The upright Cody receives the same status for 1898. The date kept changing when the poster was reprinted, so Cody's role as a victor over Napoleon was constantly updated. Now underneath both figures, you'll see some text on a kind of red background, and these texts chart for both of the figures the geographic distance of their power. For Napoleon, the military breadth, um, and for Cody, based on the circulations of his tours. French critics called Cody the Napoleon of the Prairie, the Western D'Artagnan, and the King of the Far West, elevating this American cowboy as a successor for the downtrodden Napoleon. And it's worth mentioning that while all of the other images I've shown you so far were either made or circulated in France, this one was clearly made and marketed for a US audience, and I've never found a French version um, of this image, perhaps unsurprisingly. <laughs> By the second tour of Buffalo Bill's Wild West in France in 1905, visual culture implied Cody's conquest of the country with his posters, and also with his use of the railroad system. A poster with the vague but ominous statement, je viens, I am coming, was plastered all over Paris with Cody's face in a medallion superimposed on the body of a charging bison. The bison's head is turned so that the animal appears simultaneously to be charging to the left, but also forward as though out of the image, projecting into the viewer's face. And if you look al along the borders of the poster, you can also see places where the body has actually broken through the frame of the image. Contemporaries marveled at the speed with which the show could travel, build, and take down its arena, as and so it became a symbol of technological modernity. In the 1905 tour, the ship carrying the infrastructure for the show brought about 50 Pullman rail cars to transport the troupe across the nation. And there are a couple of um, images in the French press that depict the um, removing of these cars um, from the ship. The train system that Cody used to traverse France transformed an association with the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War because of its inefficient single track into a modern success of mobility. 
The design of that route map with its red line moving across this hundred, these 115 destinations as a zigzag tour is more akin to a military map than the mapping of popular entertainment. This representation implied that the cultural colonization that resulted from exporting the American frontier to France through Buffalo Bill's Wild West um, extended to the far reaches of the French nation. In the process, the visual culture of the show invited the viewer to consider alternatives to societal enervation. An opposition between feminized French and masculine American extended to the material culture of posters. The thickly outlined and bold fonts of the show posters imply a sturdy and hard-edged character that mimics much of the rhetoric of the show itself. And this stood in dramatic contrast with the light touch and feminized grace of Art Nouveau, such as in the poster that I show you on the left. In the second tour of Buffalo Bill's Wild West in France, the export of the Rough Rider concept enhanced French perceptions of US masculinity. Cody had developed the term Rough Riders to describe the equestrian skills performed in the show in the 1890s, a moniker later adopted by the US military to refer to their equestrian forces in the Spanish-American War. Souvenir publications like the Rough Rider volume, which was translated into French, feature Cody in military garb on his horse, again, pressed right up to the front of the picture plane, like he's gonna break into your space. The Rough Riders magazine also cohered Cody with this military history by including an image of Roosevelt's Rough Riders, labeled as the heroes of the war with Cuba, as uh, in the photograph you see on the upper left. Roosevelt's rise in US politics and his emphasis on the strenuous life expanded French constructions of US masculinities. Early 20th century French books uh, argued that Roosevelt exported a particularly masculine character in this country of what one author called the intense life. In tandem, French newspapers focused on the cowboy in Buffalo Bill's Wild West as, and I'm quoting from the press, the audacious cavaliers of the American prairie and the wild horses that they brought with them, which, and again I quote, could not be dominated. Some articles emphasized the difficulty of the labor to mount wild horses and described the dangerous conditions under which this was undertaken. So critics are emphasizing the dogged vigor of cowboys in highlighting their masculine prowess. And in this way, they became an alternative to the dandy and the urban cosmopolite. The prototypical cowboy became a model for a new French generation. And in 1907, one contemporary argued that French men needed to prepare themselves alongside this example for, quote, a new generation of vigorous men. And reading these um, newspaper articles, you know, seven, eight years before World War I, it's um, kind of chilling. This nationalistic rhetoric building resounding in the idea of a, ma a virile French male, um, we find with increasing vigor um, just into the eve of the war. But there was some resistance to this model of, ma of the masculine cowboy in France because the cowboy was so rugged. To some detract detractors, the so-called civilizing force seemed also wild. While Buffalo Bill and his troupe had many enthusiastic followers in France, the circulation of some caricatures revealed a backlash against some of these gender characterizations. For example, one cartoon from the Distraction depicts two curious Parisians standing before Buffalo Bill as he sits on a docile horse. The caption asks, and after time, do your horses stay always wild? Admittedly, we train them for this, came the imagined response. This representation and its text undercuts the assumed ability of the cowboys to tame wild horses by implying the animals had already been tamed through time and repetition. And challenges of this ethos were literalized in at least two public calls to Cody's cowboys to rein in proven wild horses um, for a public audience. So these positions and postures are always contested. Some images also challenged the naturalized stereotypes of Cody's masculinity. The 1890 poster by Scottish commercial artist Alec Penrose Forbes Ritchie circulated in France in the 1905-06 tour, which you can see an example from that on the right. With its brash red color and use of icons associated with Buffalo Bill's Wild West to create Cody's visage, the cowboy hat implied with a lasso and a teepee, his eyes and eyebrows made of gun and holster and tomahawk, his mouth and beard a bison head, 
an ear as um, his uh, white horse's head, probably Tucker. Um, this poster reduces him to nothing more than a collection of stereotypes. Some French visual culture, I would argue, also challenged ideas of Cody and the cowboy as charades. For example, in a painting that you see on the left by French artist Félix Morel-Lemy, made in 1905, and I've been able to find absolutely nothing about this artist uh, and the context of this picture, so if anyone's heard of him, please let me know. Um, but in this representation, he's painted one of the cowboys from Buffalo Bill's Wild West during that tour and emphasizes the cowboy's sneering gaze, raised eyebrow, and brown checkered costume. The figure, the artist underscores the figure's coarse character with rough, dense brushwork. Similarly, uh, the plaster bust that you see on the right, made in 1905 by French sculptor Gustave Louis de Serre, also, I would argue, is a caricature of Cody, with his head turned to the side, his cowboy hat dramatically tilted as though being yanked off his head by a wind gust. Dussart emphasizes Cody's crooked teeth and casual costume, which seems incompatible with the traditional format of the portrait bust. By caricaturing Cody rather than heroicizing him, Dussart highlights the brass entrepreneurship and mocks his displays of masculinity. Morel Ami and Dussart both draw attention to the performed nature of the cowboy's character, and neither upholds the cowboy as a model to follow. In many ways, these two objects are antithetical to the depictions of Cody and his cowboys in the official Buffalo Bill's Wild West imagery, which, as I've shown you, um, emphasizes the militaristic prowess of the cowboy. In comparison, Morel-Ami and Dussert's images express curiosity about this masculine character, but ambivalence about the nature and impact of the Wild West ethos. Through Buffalo Bill's Wild West, the American cowboy became a hotly contested character in French culture. Visual representations of the cowboy highlighted the stoic and virile model for French masculinity, but some poked holes in this persona, caricaturing the figure instead as indicative of American cultural imperialism. Collectively, these constructions reveal the centrality of visual culture and the discourses of masculinity in building a cultural politics of competition between the US on the ascent and France on the decline that debated cultural, industrial, and military superiority. These cultural debates situated the cowboy at the crux of the shifting political relationships between France and the United States in the midst of anxieties about the feminization of French culture. Thank you.